1993, New Zealand celebrated 100 years of women's suffrage. And it was the first time a Māori woman would win a general electorate seat, becoming just the third wahine Māori to be elected to Parliament. She would go on to become the highest ranked Māori of the 1999 Labour Alliance Coalition Government. The Honourable Sandra Lee, leading the Manamotuhake Party to Parliament's front benches. Kia ora. I'm Morgan Godfrey. I'm a blogger, writer and commentator and I'm fascinated by New Zealand politics. Now, I'm speaking with former Māori MPs in Mātangirea, Parliament's historic Māori Affairs Committee room. I want to understand their place in our history and what we can learn from their political legacies. This is Mā Tangirea. Aura ki te manga, takitumu te waka, arohura te awa, poutini te tanifa, tuhuru te tangata, ngati waiwai te apu, ngai tahu tiwi. When you came into Parliament, you were the first Māori woman elected to a general seat. Can you tell us what that campaign was like? Um, rabid, really. Um, Richard Preble was desperate to hang on to a seat of Auckland Central. He was universally unpopular um, after many years of the new right agenda. I think generally at a voting level, the public had reached a point where they pretty much thought that it was impossible to change the new right political agenda that had been driven through in our country through the 80s by Douglas and Preble. And they elected Bolger and thought that the sort of Farmer Brown, traditional conservative National Party would re-emerge, only to find that it was all about more asset sales and more of the same. So uh, 1993 was a turning point. The National Party had put up as a candidate Arthur Anai, who I think was their first Pacifica candidate. And um, I was able, therefore, to sort of come through the middle. And I've always said um, it was as much a vote against Richard Preble, my election to Parliament, as it was um, about a vote for me. Uh, the Conservatives weren't comfortable with voting for a Pacifica person. Shame on them. So the Alliance seemed like a good alternative. And I did have a, quite a high local government profile, but he played for keeps, and both Arthur and I had our moments in, on the campaign trail with Richard Preble, because he's an old fighter. Did it still take you by surprise? Because despite what was happening, you know, outside in the rest of the country, outside in government, people did want to vote against that Labour government. Did it still take you by surprise that as a Māori woman you were elected to a general electorate? Yes, it did. And even though our polling showed that I was going to win, for all that, in the back of my mind's eye, even though I'd never lost an election at the local body level, um, I couldn't see myself winning that seat. And in fact, um, on the afternoon of the election, I went out to Piha, where um, on the west coast, uh, and called down south to my tūpuna tūhuru on the west coast of the South Island 
and asked me asked him to uh, give me the mana mm. to take the long walk when I can see defeat to Richard Preble <laughs> with dignity. And fortunately, it was a long walk I didn't have mm. to take. So yeah, I was surprised, to be honest. Uh, there's a wonderful quote of yours. As a Māori, as a woman, and as a conservationist, I sometimes feel like a three-time loser. Can you kind of explain what you meant by that? I was asked by many in the media, you must feel really pleased and proud to become the first Māori woman to win a general seat. But what was in my heart was, what an indictment. Mm. These people don't realise that it was actually illegal for our people to contest general seats until the law was changed in 1967. It's not easy for Māori, whatever your political colours, in a place like this. Um, as a conservationist, I'd served on the national executive of the Royal Forest and Bird Society, Protection Society, and, um, you know, what I find when it comes to conservation, and this is apropos uh, climate change as well at a political level globally today, is there's an old song that goes, um, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. And that's like conservation. Everybody, every political leader with power in the world wants conservation, just not in their backyard. That's a hiding to nowhere <laughs> as well. And then um, what else is a lefty, you name it. I, I, <laughs> you know, you've been it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you mentioned your tupuna before who intervened on your behalf, I'll frame it that way. But there are other tupuna in, in this room that we're in right now, Matangi Reya, Fetu Tirikatane Sullivan's on the wall behind me, Irawira Tirikatane is on the wall behind me as well. So I wanted to ask about your whanau and ask where did the politics come from? Well, Fetu, Fetu is actually, darling Fetu is my second cousin. We miss her very much and we've always been very proud of our whanau's Māori seat representation from the Tirakatani line. We descend from two sisters. I grew up in an eclectic house. My mother is Pautini Ngaitau from the west coast of the South Island. My father's a working class Londoner from England of Romani gypsy descent. My father was a socialist. He fought in World War II, he was in the British Royal Navy and we, he, he manned landing boats on D-Day. His brother, my uncle, was um, an engineer who did over 30 bombing raids on Lancaster bombers. So post that war, both my uncle and my father were totally disillusioned with the notion of war and they became uh, supporters of the Socialist Party of Great Britain who are an old school socialist working class movement that believe that the revolution comes through education, the ballot box and the hearts and minds of men, as opposed to what was happening down the barrel of a gun in Russia and China. Um, and of course, these two brothers married two Ngaitahu sisters, my mother and my aunt married my father's brother. So two brothers married two sisters and they were owners in our grey mafera lands. So their politics were evolved around our whanau, um, our awa, uh, their mafera lands, uh, the politics around the injustice of peppercorn rentals and leases in perpetuity. So there was an ongoing political discussion in our house. Mm. Dad was a very active member of the Water Cycle Workers Union. We marched against everything. That was my childhood, and I'm proud of it. Mm. We marched against apartheid. We marched to ban the bomb. We marched, you know, as anybody was just <laughs> going for a stroll. <laughs> Where there's a risk, we might just join them in that march, as long as it was a good cause. So I'm proud to have come from a very political background. Lee's political mentor was the Honourable Machu Rata. Rata was a Labour Māori MP for 26 years. His crowning achievement was as the architect of the Waitangi Tribunal. But in 1979, Rata was disillusioned with Labour and quit the party to form Manamotuhake. 
I've heard the story that the first time that you had contact with Machudata is you called him from Waiheke Island offering to help him in his campaign up north. Is that, is that a true story? What happened was, um, I've, I've been on a few Māori land action committees, including the Ngāti Hine Land Action Committee up north as a Māori woman conservationist with people like John Miller and Taura Eruera and others, Ronga Morton, and Karaholt Harvey were determined to get into this block of land and mill it against the wishes of the, the tangata whenua. And the Māori Land Court, Judge Nicholson presiding, in their wisdom appointed five Pākehā trustees to be the trustees over this block of land and sign the lease to Karaholt Harvey. So I'd had, through that, um, engagements with Matu back then. But when he resigned from Labour, I sent him a telegram, actually, from the Rocky Bay um, General Store. And I said, uh, right behind you, Sandra Lee, Ngaitari. And he sent me back, within an hour, a telegram that read, please organise a meeting of our people on the island. I want to explain to them why I'm leaving Labour. And of course, he came, he spoke, he was amazing. And um, we all signed up, so I'm proud to be a founding member of that political movement. I'm interested about what he would have said in 1993 when you were elected to Auckland Central. Can you remember what the first thing he said when it came through that you'd won that electorate? He was very, very pleased. On the actual night, he pretty much only said congratulations. But long before I got elected, with the benefit of hindsight, I think he'd been mentoring me um, to come to Parliament. Even when I went into Cabinet, eventually, the little things that he taught me helped me. For example, he said, when you become a Cabinet Minister, do not scuttle all the, the other parties' um, draft legislation. Um, it will help you keep your place in the order paper so what you do is you technically keep them and then completely rewrite them. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the drop on some of your cabinet colleagues. Little tricks of the trade like that. Um, he taught me that if you've got no way to win a motion and no way to get media attention, table a white paper in the house. I said, OK, what is the significance of a white paper? He said, absolutely nothing. <laughs> but when you call it a white paper, the whole of the press gallery will want to see it. <laughs> He was, in my mind, one of the biggest figures of the 20th century, especially for Māori and actually for New Zealand as a whole. But I want to ask really quickly, do you think we're at risk of losing that memory of him? I fear that. Um, I think it's very important that the person who created the notion of the treaty process, mm. the Waitangi Tribunal and its legislation, should have a monument erected to him mm. right here because New Zealand needs to contemplate what the landscape of our country would have looked like had he not had the foresight right back in the mid-70s in what was a very conservative racist country then, in my view, if he had not got that legislation through. And the relief that that has provided for the long-held grievances of our people all over Aotearoa has been enormous. Did he ever ring you up and tell you, you know, this is the legislation you've got to put through or anything like that? Was he, was he that close politically? Yes. Or did he take that stand back and let you go, go forward? He, he always let me have my head, always. But he would encourage me to stick up for myself internally within the alliance um, and give advice on... Uh, Lots of other things. There were times when he was quite direct. I remember when the occupation of Pākei Tori occurred, and I said to Matthew on the phone, I, I feel a, a need to go. You know, I need to get leave from the house to go up there and show my solidarity. He said, no, 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 not yet. <laughs> he said, write a letter to the local MP, Koro Wetri, because people had sort of forgotten that. Hmm. You know, all the focus was on the other MPs and the mayor. So he said, write a letter to Kuro and tell him that you will render all assistance to the local Māori MP in resolving this dreadful thing that's occurred for our people and has stood for so long. 
So I wrote it down word for word and got the message and sent it across to um, Paul. I never heard anything. And I saw him in the lobby a couple of days later and I said, oh, Paul, did you get that letter from me about supporting you and taking action for our people at Pākai Tori? And he said, yes, dear, thank you. How is Machu? <laughs> I wonder, having told that story, I wonder if there was ever a time where you got his instructions wrong and he gave you a telling off. Never. How did his passing affect you? That was uh, one of the hardest things, mm. yeah. I felt very alone here after he died. Um, it was very hard. Were there ways after after his passing that you looked back and you thought, much has prepared me for this? No, I felt um, very much adrift and whereas I could ring him at any time, day or night and get political guidance on, on um, issues here that are gone. Mm. And he would ring me, you know, sometimes several times a day, sometimes once a day. Uh, depending on what we were dealing with. And my parliamentary secretary was my cousin, Leslie Lusich, and after he passed away, she accidentally dialed his number once and got his answer phone and came in my office crying her heart out. And we dialed it again and again <laughs> so we could just hear his voice one more time. And I, so, no. Uh, it was a, a huge loss, but more importantly, for the whole country and for our people. Because when he came to this place on a visit, he'd go around every political party and every Māori in it. He'd make time and he'd be sowing seeds. You, know, you entered government in 1999. I wonder what the negotiations were back at that time. The alliance was entering with the Labour Party. Were they as tough as you imagined that they were going to be? No, they were easy. Um, because both Labour and the Alliance had learned the hard way in '96 how not to get into government when you could have. The Alliance made a critical error uh, in setting 12 fundamental policy principles that we basically ordered Labour to side up to in advance of the election, or we're not joining you guys. There was stuff from the Labour side as well, but the truth was that there was still a lot of hara and personal baggage between some of the people in the Alliance, key players, who'd been part of that Labour Party, who'd had the courage to walk out with Jim Anderton from the Labour Party and the Labour government when he stood up and said, you guys have got no clothes on. The Emperor has no clothes. This new right agenda is crazy. The first person Helen Clark approached about the possibility of not making the same mistake in 1999 was me, and she has said so publicly. The reason for that was that I had never been a member of the Labour Party, so I hadn't come out um, with bad blood from a split in the Labour Party post Roger Douglas. So she asked me what I thought about it, and I said, well, it's essential, and that we've lost three years is not good. And I said, you know, I, I, I'm going to, as soon as I finish speaking to you as a loyal deputy to Jim Anderton, I'll be going straight to tell him you called me in here. Mm. And I will be telling him why we need to open these lines of communication. But anybody with half a brain on the left knew that that's what had to happen. And that's what the public wanted under MMP. Did you do, end up developing quite a close relationship with Helen Clark? Because I know that in that term, 99 to 2002, that she came out quite strongly in support of you and the media and various other places. So were you two personally close or merely just politically close? Politically close. Um, she is an incredibly intelligent, driven person. She was an ex-Minister of Conservation. So it made my job easy as a, as a Minister of Conservation myself. She understood the portfolio. She understood the fact that the Department of Cons Conservation had been underfunded from its inception. All of the issues that the NGOs, like Forest and Bird, had been campaigning for, she was across. So she basically gave me my head, and it was a pleasure to work with her, quite frankly. 
I felt a bit more of a collegiate spirit from you sometimes than I did many of my own alliance <laughs> colleagues. I wanted to talk about some of the things that you had actually put a stop to. So things like the logging of native forests on the west coast, things like the Macreas mine on the west coast as well. I wanted to ask how that felt to you personally to be able to put a stop to those things in your tohi, in your home area. Wonderful. <laughs> it was like getting let loose in the lolly shop. <laughs> No more marching with a banner or writing submissions with Forrest and Bird. Wow, we've got the keys. Let's rumble. <laughs> so it was that, it's fair to say though, I didn't win the hearts and minds of Pakeas on the west coast of the <laughs> South Island. And they did tend to turn up on the doorstep out there quite regularly and often. But it was wonderful because when you've spent a long time in opposition and having to lobby, be able to be in government, be it ever so briefly, and get in and do 132,000 hectares of rainforest mm. protected. Uh, they were state-owned rainforests. Isn't it wonderful, you know, as, as, as we watch people despair and governments talking about planting trees in response to um, climate change, isn't it fabulous? that all of that beach forest is still standing. Was that in your mind at the time? Hell that yeah. this was a climate change action? Absolutely. I wonder too about the, not necessarily about the reaction of Pakeas on the West Coast, which you said was possibly quite negative, but the reaction of your own people on the West Coast. What, what did they say to you? About Timberland's West Coast? Mm. Oh, my park cousins were proud and pleased with me. You know, they're, they're right there on the river. Mm, mm. You know, they're, they're watching the tide come in. They're watching our park going underwater mm. that we're all paying rates on. You know, the rate bills are getting bigger and, um, and the water's getting higher. Mm. Um, they have observed the pillaging of our ponamu since time immemorial. You know, it doesn't float their boat to watch our native ngahere being torn to the ground and shipped out. So, no, they were pleased. My cousins were very supportive of me. Mm. You, sir, as Minister of Conservation, you secured 200 million for the National Biodiversity Plan. You helped clear places like Campbell Island of pests. But I want to quickly look at your role as Associate Māori Affairs Minister because I don't think that gets as much attention. Did you have much responsibility there? Well, there were four of us, at the risk of sounding like Lady Di. <laughs> there were four of us in this marriage. Uh, Parikura was a minister. Uh, originally, Dover was a minister, but um, uh, there was some co controversy around that. And then Parikura became the minister, and Tariana and I. So there were four of us. And uh, Sir Ngātatala was the chief executive of TPK at that time. And we worked well together. You know, there was no conflict or um, problems there. There's plenty of work to do. The theory was uh, that the government as a reforming government would be closing the gaps. And I guess the statistics today speak for themselves. Those gaps didn't get closed and still haven't been closed and the disparities are still there. Here's my problem with the thing is that even the mainstream media place great emphasis on the notion of TPK and the role of the Minister of Māori Affairs. But in truth, TPK is a completely powerless, moneyless, essentially, entity of a government department. When it was established, the theory was that its role would be as a monitoring agency, that it wouldn't be a little bit of the pie for Māori coming from the Crown, but a monitoring agency making sure that Māori were getting all the pieces, the pies, through the state services. And that never happened. And I get very nostalgic about the old Department of Māori and Island mm. Affairs that I grew up with. They had the most magnificent trade training schemes that were building houses for Māori, including the one I grew up in. They had their own social workers. And these were people who could really reach into the community to address families that were failing. They were not people who got a degree through Auckland University or Victoria University. These were people that had just 
held a lot of mana in the communities. And I'm all for the rebuilding of a real Ministry of Māori Development, not centred on the corporate model, but those ordinary citizens who are Māori who are out there that are overrepresented in all the negative statistics, undereducated, mm. underfed, underhoused, those folk. Mm. I just want to take you back to the Timberlands controversy again where you put a stop to the native of those logging trees. And I just want to ask something very particular. With that opposition, did you feel like you were being targeted as a Māori? Um, no, I suspect that um, if a Pākehā minister from the National Party had done it, that had probably kicked up the dust as well. Um, but I think that being a local Māori in terms of my papakāinga, a brass and wolf a little bit mm. more. Um, I know that the West Coast are often described as stoic and resilient and battlers and that. But uh, they're guilty of their fair share of red neckery here and there as well. Formed in 1991, the Alliance was a grouping of left-wing parties, including New Labour, the Greens, the Democrats and Mana Motuhake. Lee was both the leader of Mana Motuhake and the deputy leader of the Alliance. We know that in that term, 99 to 2002, there were all sorts of internal issues between the different factions within the parties, and that included the different factions within Mana Motuhake. There was the leadership challenge to you. Did you see that coming back then? Yeah. Yeah, Tuhoi went out for a smoke <laughs> at Piritahi Marae during our hui atau on Waiheke Island, bless them, they were our staunchest branch and they were meant to put down the tonu and unfortunately because they missed the moment, um, Watia Marae, Willie Jackson's Marae, put it down mm. while they were outside and um, so from that moment, for all of us long-standing members of our party, Mana Motaki, of which Willie wasn't, he originally joined the NLP and um, moved across to our party in the hope that it would get him a higher list ranking. The writing was on the wall from right then, and part of the thinking behind that was that there was a school of thought at the high level in the alliance that felt that the parties that went to make up the alliance were redundant that the alliance, alliance proper was a political movement, the relevant movement, and so therefore parties like um, Mana Motuhake and the Democrats were as electoral entities, surplus to requirements. Now, the Greens party, which was part of the alliance, had seen the writing on the wall, and they pulled the ribcord and decided to, decided to bail and stand as an independent party. Um, the rest of the parties in the alliance didn't. So the rolling of Mana Motuhake essentially um, at Waitia Marae at that time was actually two pronged in my opinion. One, it was to help facilitate the shove towards the merging of all the political parties that were in the alliance. And two, probably the first steps towards um, challenging the leadership of the Alliance, both Jim Anderton and myself. Did it feel like a Pākehā bureaucracy in the Alliance, in the form of the Alliance, must lean in on a Kaupapa Māori party? Well, Machu had um, made sure prior to signing up to join this coalition that the Māori seats and their campaigns would be the preserve of our party that our party's policies would be that carried over and put into the alliance framework as well. We didn't feel like we were being pushed around, quite frankly. But later, as more of our people joined, I'm thinking about people like Ella Henry and other candidates who were wanting Māori, who were wanting to stand in general seats, I felt that those of our people were, were getting marginalised by the wider alliance, um, some of whom seemed to resent the notion of Māori standing and contesting for selection and uh, other general seats. 
Do you think that it's ever possible for a Kaupapa Māori Party to be in a relationship with a predominantly Pākehā party, whether it's Manumbutu Hake or the Māori Party in National or some future party? Do you ever think there's a future down that road? Well, like it or not, coalitions are the name of the game under MMP. That's the first thing. But would I endorse uh, the notion of an alliance-type model with a Māori party within it? Definitely not. And in fact, with the benefit of hindsight, but I thought it anyway prior to, the only valid political parties within the alliance with any long-staying um, validity, in my view, were the Green Party mm -hmm. and Manumotuhaki, or a Māori party. Mm -hmm. That's what MNP allows for realistically in this place. Um, the new Labour Party became irrelevant the minute that Labour lurched back to the left-ish. Um, the Christian parties don't fly, and sadly, the Democratic Party, wonderful that they were, they were good people in that movement, for all that, um, they've got a lot of their policies up in any way. Uh, uh, MMPs changed their relevance as well. So will it always be logical for there to be a Māori party and room for it under MMP here? You bet, like the Greens. Uh, who they go into a coalition with is high risk. There's no argument about that, but like the Greens. Uh, any minor party that goes into a coalition government immediately renders itself a threat, and that's just by virtue of that electoral system. Speaking about coalitions, you mentioned earlier that you got on quite well as Associate Māori Affairs Minister. You worked quite well with the four other, uh, the Minister and the three other Associate Ministers. So I want to ask about Kotahitanga and whether there was ever a time in Parliament that stands out for you as a good example of that Kotahitanga. Yes, and I confess it's the only time I ever shed a little tear in the house. And I had a good excuse to shed a lot of them because they were quite often having a go at me in that place. But the Māori Reserve Land Act was hated by my hapu. The shareholders in the Mafia Corporation have been ripped off since time immemorial. The Crown, for example, had a Māori lease over a piece of land that they had a high school on in Greymouth. And it actually cost us more annually to send the bill to get the rent than we got back in rent. I think the bill was, the cost of the account in sending the bill was 22 bucks. And the Crown paid $15 a year for all the ground that that specific high school sat on. So finally, finally, um, under National, ironically, it was decided that that rotten piece of racist legislation called the Māori Reserve Land Act was going to be amended. That is because Shipley was depending on the support of the Type 5 that had become the Type 4, really. And they set about um, getting some grandparenting changes written into the legislation. And we all worked together on that. And right to the very end, Tuku Morgan and I were tearing in and out of the lobby, adjusting wording. So really all the Māori and peace in the House at that time were all working with a common cause for a common goal, which was to remove an incredibly uh, unjust piece of legislation. And it felt really good. Mm -hmm. I wonder about, about common cause, but this time from a more critical angle. You were in Parliament when the Naitahu settlement bill went ahead. Uh, Fetu Te Kātini Sullivan was also in Parliament. And I understand you were both critics of this bill. Can you explain why? Or can you explain the times? Well, what you've got to remember is back then it was envisaged that the Ngaitahu settlement would be the first. Uh, as it was, because of the issues that arose from it, Tainui settled first. But that was the intention. It was introduced to Parliament with all standing or under urgency, with all standing orders suspended. Outrageous. Those sort of provisions normally apply to when a government's going to announce they're going to war. Furthermore, even though it got referred to this very select committee, the minister made it very clear that the select committee could not make any amendments whatsoever to the, from memory, 560-page bill. 
the bill had a provision in it that said this new corporate entity, Te Runanga o Ngaitahu, shall represent Ngaitahu, every one of us, for all purposes. The all purposes didn't even define what the all purposes were in, say, the interpretation or the schedule. It was just all the power is going into this corporate entity. The overwhelming majority of the people who came and made submissions made submissions against the structural arrangements in the legislation. This wasn't a ngaitahu, including myself, who were against the notion of a settlement for our people. Of course we all wanted them. What we didn't want, though, was that the proprietorial rights, the mana of the hapu, the control of the assets that belong in a small block to a immediate extended family or whatever, that they weren't taken away. And the irony is that since the Ngaitahu settlement, the length and breadth of this land, whatever iwi you look at, north, south, east or west, this whole marginalisation of the hapu, the insistence by the Crown of a corporate model, the way that it gets rolled out with these pregnant conditions um, has caused division, sadness, anxiety and pain for every single iwi, every one of whom are wanting to pursue, of course, a settlement to long-standing grievances. You made a really prescient comment, I think, in the third reading, the third and final reading of that bill, where you said to the House that one day our children and grandchildren will be back to re-engage yours, referring yours to the Crown, and saying that one day they'll be back to renegotiate these settlements. Do you still think that's true? Absolutely. Um, I think, um, with my own iwi, what are we up to? Uh, attempt number four, the last Ngaitahu settlement, was attempt number four at, at having a settlement. And, um, and our people have got to go back. We, we, we'll, we're going to be going back forever. The notion that there can be a finite time where suddenly everybody moves into incredibly decent people and uh, fair and just, and the, um, the notion of breaches of the treaty can't occur, and that settlements of those breaches can't occur is naive. Our people will be back. You know, I would like to see uh, um, coastal iwi in particular taking a claim to the Waitangi Tribunal over the issue of inundation being caused on our marae, like my own, as a direct result of climate change. And it's good to see that that's happening in the Pacific. And we could really think back and perhaps take a unified position, Māori and Pacifica, our Polynesian cousins, and all trolley off to the United Nations as well. Wouldn't that be good? I like the symmetry here that it was Machurata, your political mentor, who made all of this possible in the first place. So if you wanted to make a claim on climate change in the Waitangi Tribunal, you could because of Machurata. But when he brought the act in in 1975, it was limited to those contemporary claims, like a climate change claim you would lodge today. But did he at the time in 1975, do you know if he had this vision in mind of actually I want this to be able to look backwards as well as forwards? Absolutely. And he knew that. And people that he worked um, with, uh, like uh, Pat Hohepa, they, they both knew that the minute that the lid was lifted, um, that there would be no political choice. They would have, there would have to be redress going right back to where the real grievances sat. So the legislation originally, although it was poo-pooed by some activists as being um, of little use because it wasn't adequate in the way that it took its retrospective reach at historical grievances, I know, and he's told me, and I believe him, but also respecting the minds of others who were around much at that time, that they knew that it was only a matter of time, a ticking time bomb, waiting for that to occur. And of course it did. Mm. When your mokos ask you, what's your proudest achievement, Nan, what would you say to them? Them. <laughs> <laughs> Politically, give me the political answer. Politically. Um, no doubt 132,000 hectares of the ngāhere mai rohe was a good feeling. 
Um, I think some of the best things to celebrate um, for me have been um, stopping things rather than starting things. Mm. Rewriting the Local Government Act was important, especially for Māori. When I got at it, and it was a, a large piece of legislation, a thousand pages long, it was so antiquated it had rules about um, removing horse poop from, from the public roads and the regulations on setting the local town clock. It was picked up from England and dumped on Māori and the rest of New Zealand. So to actually be able to rewrite the whole damn lot of it um, and to put the treaty for the first time in that important and relevant legislation for our people, because it's at that council level, wherever it might be, the Bay of Plenty, Hokitika, wherever it is, that's our people's first interface quite often. So to be able to do that um, felt good. Mm -hmm. You know, I was glad that I got away with it. Sadly, having retired from Parliament, when National got back in, um, they immediately set about amending it, amending <laughs> it as fast as they possibly could. But the treaty's still there. Mm. Another thing they kept were Māori seats in local government as well. And talking about Māori seats, I wonder about your advice to the next generation of not just Māori seat holders, but of Māori MPs in this place. Having come through here, you were a party leader, you were a minister. What would you tell those aspiring, that next generation of MPs? I think every single Māori member of parliament who comes here, no matter what their political party, no matter what their gender, no matter what their every, have a fundamental duty of care when they reach this place to ensure that they have and hold five things Māori on their hands, on their fingers, that they carry to this place for change, for the good, for our people. And when in this place, the lifestyle, the status, the pay packet becomes more important than those treasures, then it's time for you to leave. Mm. But the important thing is to remember to these young ones coming in now, it's not all on your shoulders. It's not all up to you. Our people have been here before you. Our people will be coming. They're the cavalry. They're the reinforcements after you. Do the very best you can, mm. but it's not all up to you. Mm. This program was made possible by the RNZ NZ On Air Innovation Fund.